Let's talk about something that extends, I think, right alongside rest periods, and that's going to be RPE, our exertion, our, our perceived exertion throughout our, our programming, throughout our sets and, and each exercise, or RIR, so that those reps in reserve. So after each set, it's kind of like, after, you know, it's after a set of 10, you rack the weight and you think to yourself, how many reps could I have done before hitting failure, right? Or a scale of one to 10, how hard was that set? Eh, maybe a seven or eight, right? Sort of that pain scale at the doctor that they ask. It's like, out of one to 10, how's your pain? Kind of like that, right? So in terms of RPE or RIR, how is that played into your client programming, Sue? And how are you utilizing that either with yourself as an athlete or with your clients uh, in their programming to help them stay within their, their ability to work hard, but not overdoing it? Yeah. So this is something, again, where it helps within variables to limit the variables that are happening. Because when we look at training, there's obviously a ton of variables that can happen. So the more that we can put in a structure or an outline of the variables that are not going to change, the easier it is and the more efficient and better it is. So it's not just easier for us. It literally gets better for us as coaches to be able to program for the clients. So if I have no idea that you're going to failure absolutely every set, every time, then that's gonna be something that does not give me good information when it comes to planning your next phase or planning a deload or taking that data and being like, man, I'm surprised this was so much volume for this person. But those failure sets can add on a whole heck of a lot of volume to a training phase. If I have a the same exact training phase and someone does everything to failure versus someone does nothing to failure, completely different adaptations that that person is getting and completely different stress that's putting on the body, which is also going to change the nutrition that's in play. And so it really helps get a better feel and create a baseline for clients because I know for myself and I know for Alex and Austin as well, I have some clients that will just train bucking hard just point blank. They are hard trainers. They will push. They love to train and they will take themselves into that deep part of their mind and bury themselves in sessions because they just love it. And I'm sometimes that way. And Alex has to tell me, hey, this is freaking RPE 7, like pull it back. And so it's something where it also helps bring, like I said, everyone to a baseline of, hey, this is where I want you for this set so that I can see from this data input, what the output is, and then what I need to change within the input. All of this is a major math equation, plus, of course, your experience and anecdotal things laid into it. But at the end of the day, it's also an equation that you're utilizing. And when we look at any kind of research study, what do they try to do? They try to limit the variable so they're able to truly see at the base of it what is causing what. And so within RP and RIR, it's extremely helpful because, again, I have some clients that will train everything to failure if I don't tell them otherwise, and some that will never even get close to failure ever because they don't know how to push themselves that way. So it allows me as the coach to really make sure that I'm understanding how they're responding to the training. And then it also allows me to manage their fatigue of, hey, let's like not take anything to failure because that's pushing it over the threshold. But I'm really enjoying this training phase and what progress we're seeing, but we just don't need to push it that far. And so it's extremely, extremely helpful to utilize. And every single training program I send out, uh, has the RPE or IR on it, or I'll note in the email, keep everything to a seven RPE or everything to a this RPE. And I even have a client in peak week right now. And so that's something very helpful if I don't want to accumulate excess in inflammation. So she is not taking anything to failure in this week, just as I will not be taking anything to failure within my peak week. Yeah. And I think that 
utilizing RPE and RIR comes as a progression. So uh, when we look at an individual performing exercises, if they can't execute the movement, the interpretation of the RP and the RIR is not necessarily as valuable of a tool because we're already at a higher risk of injury for the individual not executing the movement well. So once we have the execution in place, at that point, then we start to implement the RPE and the RIR that is allocated um, for those exercises specifically. And you also have to have an understanding of what failure truly feels like because more often than not, especially if the individual has never been pushed maybe in an athletic background or they have been pushed through like fatigue and those different factors, as soon as something foreign feel like feeling wise within the the tissue, they give up. I think that this is something that I talked about uh, abundantly within one of our our mentorship calls uh, with one of our clients uh, recently is that they have clients where they'll send video and uh, they'll be like, okay, I want you to do an RPE of eight, but then they watch the video and it's like an RP of four. And the reality is, is that that person has no idea what proximity to failure even feels like. And as soon as they have any uh, feeling of burn or, or excess tension, they're like, okay, that's it. I'm done. There's, there's no more <laughs> in the tank. Like put the leg extension down. Do not let it, like I need a break. Um, and so understand that when you're assessing this, this is going to be something that, again, is going to take time and you're going to be in a position where each like each year, each month, you're getting better and better at understanding where that threshold is. And when we utilize sets to failure within our training, this is a great tool for the client to understand and a massive tool for your um, note taking within your training journal and those different factors of when you take that set to failure, really note like on the side there of how did it feel? How many repetitions did you get either past the allotted repetitions or how many repetitions did you get under it? Um, those different things so that you can continue to educate yourself on your own body. Um, because understanding those variables allows for you to excel much greater through the training itself. Yeah. There's just so many good points in this podcast where I'm like, I'm so glad that you mentioned that of something that just carries on the conversation. So I'm really loving this one so far. And that's, again, something I talk about in the training journal YouTube video that will be coming out is that making notes in my training journal has been instrumental in me being able to understand and to give that feedback to myself and to my coach. So being able to write in there, I'll write down uh, what time it is, how many meals I've had, how how much water I've had in place, where my headspace is at. And that's really helpful as well. So I know, hey, if this day was a little bit off or I reached failure a lot quicker, it's due to these variables. And so it just helps cut down as well as helps that understanding. But like you said, it is going to change. So my RPE of 10 from a few years ago versus now, completely different metrics. But it's something where since Alex has worked with me during all of that time, he's been able to see that progression. And when I I talk about I have some clients that'll just train and some that just don't know or don't have the desire to train that way. That's something I also take into consideration when I'm working with clients of, oh, I know that when I say this set to failure, that all the other sets are pretty dang close and they're pushing really hard. So I have to undulate that within the training. So it allows your coach to be better at coaching you if they have this information and they see videos from you and you have conversations and you're honest and you're self-aware and you're transparent, that's when coaching really works. And so it, it, it can work a lot of other ways, but it like really gets into like the nitty gritty when that happens. Uh, so the better you can become at that, the better your coaching relationship can get as well.